Jessica, welcome to the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast, and I am so excited to have you here. Thanks so much, Cheryl. I'm excited to talk to you about all sorts of good stuff today. Yes. Well, I have so I've been enjoying your book, your latest book, Middle School Safety Goggles Advised, Exploring the Weird Stuff from Gossip to Grades, Clicks to Crushes, and Popularity to Peer Pressure. So I just want you to start out before we really get into the, the meat of the book. Please share a little bit about yourself and what was your inspiration to writing this latest book? Yeah, well, my name is Jessica Spear and I write books for middle grade kids. So anywhere from eight to 14. And I've got a background in social sciences. And I love to dive into tricky social stuff. Um, you know, human behavior fascinates me. I'm also the mom of two teens. So I really started writing when they were in early el elementary school because I noted that um, relationships are getting more complicated. Um, so I, I was curious about that and so so that actually grew into a friendship program that grew into my first book. And then when I hit middle school, I noticed things even got more complicated. And middle school is such an interesting time for so many people. So as a writer and a researcher, I thought, what if, what if I really dove into what is happening in middle school and, and really dissected it for kids, you know, with kids. And so that's how I came about, you know, writing this book, Middle School Safety Goggles Advise, with, which just, just it does exactly that. It's kind of filled with humor, uses kind of a, a funky scientific process to dissect your know, tricky stuff that does start to surface in those middle school years. Well, it is such a fun book. And I love the illustrations in the book. She's wonderful. Isn't she? Yeah. Yeah. Leslie, yeah. Ig Leslie Igmart. So yeah, I will shout out her. She's amazing illustrator that she's done. She's done my third book too, but she's incredible. So she brings it to life, you know, through her comic sort of illustrations. And I love the front cover because, and I wish I had it here. I got the Kindle version to show, but it is, it makes me want to read it. Like I was thinking, I wish I would have had this book as a middle schooler because it would have helped me because those years are so hard. They're, they are. Mm -hmm. So much to navigate. And I think even harder now and coming out of the pandemic. Um, but you, you wrote a book a year ago about, right? And it was called um, not really, it's um, BFF. Yeah, BFF, BFF or NRF. I had written it wrong. Yeah, BFF or not really friends. What's the rest of the title? A Girl's Guide to Happy Friendships. And so that book actually grew out of a friendship program that I ran that was mostly um, populated by girls. You know, I, I, I wish I had more boys in there, but it just turns out that a lot of girls were the ones that frequented that program. And, you know, through that, that program, I kind of learned a lot of like, just friendship truths that we learn over the course of our lives that I wanted to share with girls earlier, along with a lot of the stories I heard from girls. So that grew into that first book. Yeah. So it's got a, it's got a mouthful of a title, BFF or NRF, which is not really friends, a girl's guide to happy friendships. Yeah. Yeah. And so how is this book different than that one? This one, so I really wanted to tackle something for all genders and really specific middle school ages. So I wanted, you know, so for this this book, Middle School Safety Goggles Advised, I wanted really the reader to be the protagonist. So, you know, it is sort of a nonfiction guidebook, but it's filled with choose your own ending stories. And these are stories that when I was researching and working with, I was working with seventh graders, I'd hear these scenarios over and over. I'm like, wow, this is a thing. This happens. So I would turn those into these choose your own ending stories um, that gives the reader a chance to navigate. How might I do that? If, if all this gossip is spreading about me, what might I do in that situation? Or what might I do if my best friend and I have a crush on the same person and the dance is coming up? So, so it just explores um, in a really safe way a lot of these predicaments that come up for middle schoolers, you know, during those years. I love that part of the book because as, as moms, caregivers, it's really easy. I think when, and I have a son and two daughters and they're boys, you know, I want to ask you about that, but we, right now, just for sake of like telling my story, 
it was really difficult when my two girls would get in the car and they would have something happen in middle school and they would share it. And it was, it was so easy to like get upset first. It would just remind me of being back in middle school and I would, my mama bear would come out and then I would want to like tell them what they need to do or try to make it better or fix it in some way, which I know um, it's not, even though of course we want to do that, it's not that helpful because first of all, they can patch it up the next day. And there, you talk about that in the book and conflict versus, you know, bullying, which I want you to talk about a little bit, but getting them to think about what they can do proactively mm -hmm. and problem solve really empowers kids. And that was why I just thought, gosh, that's so good that you get them to think about what am I going to do in this situation? Yeah. Yeah. Because one of the things that's so tricky about middle school is this is the first time they're really dealing with this stuff at this level. So of course it gets tricky and uncomfortable because they've never dealt with this before. And as we know, as adults, sometimes dealing with tricky social stuff is still hard, you know, so of course, it's going to be complicated for them. But what was so in interesting, um, as I was writing and, and testing this with beta readers is I would, you know, write this scenario. So let's go back to you and your best friend have a crush on the same person and the dance is coming. And then I'd write some endings to that story. And when I test it out, you know, kids had different responses on how they felt was the right way to respond. So that was such that was so enlightening for me, because of course, there's not just one way to respond. And how we respond is going to depend on us and our experiences and our personality and our values. So um, that's really good for us to know as parents that, you know, sometimes we come in with what we think the right answer might be, but that might not be the right answer for our kid in that moment, given that circumstance, you know, so, so, you know, throwing these choose your own ending stories at kids gives them a chance to think through that and what might I do in that situation you know and maybe with some practice you know they if that situation comes up you never know they, they might they might navigate it differently but of course it's it's all trial and error at this age you know and mistakes and misunderstandings are so common yes yes well you um you explore 10 common middle school experiences. And I love, I'm sorry, I love how you call them weird behaviors. First of all, I want to ask you, what made you decide to call them weird behaviors? Yeah, and there, I put so much thought into this. So I'm glad you mentioned that. So how I started with this book, I always start researching with kids. So I spent, you know, the course of a year in seventh grade classrooms. And I started with this question. I was like, hey, so what are the tricky kind of weird things about middle school, you know, that you would really want to see in a book, like, you know, that's maybe not out there. And so I use that word because I don't want to say, I don't want to, you know, say that they're bad or good or anything. They're just, you know, I could have said different. I could have said tricky, but I thought weird because, you know, what I was hearing back from them is they are a little weird and uncomfortable. So, so it started with that question, me asking students, you know, what is the tricky, weird stuff that happens in middle school? And that kind of opened the floodgates. I got all sorts of responses. Um, but when I tabulated those responses, 10 things rose to the surface. I'm like, oh, okay, this is really consistent that these 10 things are that the, the top 10 list of the weirdest things that go down in middle school. So I thought, perfect, you know, I'll start there. That's what I'll do. I'll, I'll try to unpack these in a way that uh, helps kids navigate them. Yeah, I I thought it's so inviting, weird, you know, it's because it does feel weird and awkward when I think back to middle school. So I loved that. Um, and like you said, they are navigating this for the first time. And that's awkward and hard. Yeah, and it, it doesn't may, you know, sometimes we tend to think this is bad, but this is a natural transition that they're going through. So, um, yeah, I, I really love that. Um, so you list 10, can you, the first chapter, number one, weird behavior is harsh judgment. Mm -hmm. Will you talk more about why harsh judgment? Yeah. And, and that, so that one, so when I was talking with seventh grade classrooms about what were some of the weird, tricky things about middle school, 
some of the comments that were the most frequent were some you know, mean remarks, rude comments, snide looks. So what I did is I, I thought, well, all of this is really sharing that these students are feeling judged by their peers. So I thought, let's start there. Let's start there and unpack judgment, you know, and what that feels like and why we do that. Um, and, you know, I think some of this judgment was absolutely real. Um, and some of it might have been the fear of being judged that students had. They, they were afraid of the, the judgment they might get from their peers if they look a certain way or do a certain thing. Um, but that was very real that, that they felt, you know, judged by their peers or they were feared, they are fearful of being judged by their peers. So I thought, perfect, let's start with their chapter one, you know, harsh judgment. So, so I unpack that, you know, what is that? Why, why do we do that as humans? And, you know, what's underneath that, you know, it, it, and it's a blend of, you know, fearing difference, maybe our own insecurity, you know, it, there's students in middle school tend to, you know, categorize themselves. Um, so it's all of that blended together. So of course it feels uncomfortable and and they're navigating that as best as they can. I love how you talk about the importance of belonging. And that's such a struggle for kids this age and trying to figure out where do I belong? Where do I fit in? And then that, that judgment going along with that, like wanting to be accepted, wanting to be liked, and then fearing that judgment. And I hear from a lot of moms that have kids that are especially struggling with that. How would you advise um, a parent to help when their, their daughter or their son comes home from school and says, I'm being left out, mm -hmm. uh, they're judging me, um, I'm being excluded. What, what do you, what do you, how do you think that um, parents can help? Yeah, and that's such a tough one, you know, because as parents, that just breaks our heart. You know, we when our kids are feeling that is so uncomfortable. And what I did hear from students is that everybody at some point, you know, especially during middle school is experiencing that discomfort. Um, and there is this process where they are trying to figure out where do they feel like they have connection and a fit? And that has some ups and downs. You know, they might end up in a group that it's not a good fit. Some groups are more critical of others and some are more accepting of others. And so so as kids navigate this, they, they tend to find um, over time, the right fit, but it's it tends to be some ups and downs. But what I, in the book, what I encourage kids to realize is one, when people are, are criticizing you and hudging or judging you harshly, it's really not about you. So even though that is so, it's so hard to remember, but it's really not about you. So, you know, we can remind our kids that we can remind them that ideally we want to find a friend or a, a couple of friends that we do feel like it's a good fit and that we have, you know, we feel accepted and we have some connection there. And sometimes that takes time. So, you know, just letting kids know that, hey, you are okay. And, you know, this, this take, this process takes time, you know, keep at it, you know, keep looking for the friends that, that light you up rather than the ones that bring you down. Um, so just encouraging them in those ways, but knowing that, you know, this is the real common thing in middle school, you know, so, so as parents, we can ground ourselves, you know, try to stay as, as calm and grounded as we can and as loving and supportive and hear them, let them process those uncomfortable emotions and just guiding them to keep looking out for those friends that feel like a good fit. I love that you're saying that. And I was watching as I was preparing some of the videos that you've done and things to say, things that we tend to say as parents and then what not to say and validating their feelings and not minimizing like that rather than, you know, trying to talk them out of the hurt saying, you know, wow, that I can see how that hurt. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah, I thought that was so good. So they can go to your YouTube channel <laughs> or your website as well, which will, we'll share, we'll share your website. Um, when we're, you know, when we're towards the end, but I was, I was wanting you to share um, with our listeners, because you make such a good distinction between conflict and bullying. And it's, it's easy when they come home and they tell you how they've been hurt to, you know, to get really emotional as a mom. And so how do we discern the difference? 
Yeah, and and this this happens a lot because sometimes we we jump right to oh that's bullying when it's actually a conflict that kids are are trying to figure out you know the skills to navigate conflict in healthy ways. And let's face it, a lot of adults still don't have great skills to navigate conflict in healthy ways. So when I say conflict, I'm 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 talking about this is strife between people or people within a group, some sort of strife. It could be it could be um, somebody actually did say something really mean and and really offended and hurt somebody but i'm going to put that all in you know the conflict bucket it tends to be you know both sides um, um it's not super aggressive maybe it's one time um and you know it just needs some sort of resolution healing okay so that and you know the the, the people involved tend to be on an equal playing field as far as like status and power so where that gets different from bullying is there is a power differential so one person might have more social status or physical power um so there's there tends to be some sort of difference in power and it feels very one way. So one person is being targeted and it's pretty aggressive. It's, you know, pretty mean um, and it, it goes on over time. So it's not just kind of a one and done. It's, it seems to ha be happening over time. So that is, sounds to me like a case of bullying where some intervention does need to happen and, and we need to get some help for that. But if it's a case of conflict, you know, that's an opportunity for us to think about what is a way to help our kids navigate conflict you know and sometimes it is putting a boundary down or maybe putting some space in that relationship or speaking up um, so there's all sorts of ways that we do resolve conflict but it's important to know the difference so that we can help our kids learn the skills for the inevitable conflicts that they will have you know with their peers yeah one thing that i really noticed with my daughters is the drama piece which you talk about and coming, getting in the car and they'd had conflict, but it was usually like one friend got upset with them. So then told another friend and then the other friend told, you know, came back to them and then there would be this drama. And I, I remember I did it, did not do it well with my oldest, but by the time my youngest came along nine years later, I had learned a few things and I was like, wow, what did you do? Like that must have hurt. And she's like, yes, it did. And I'm like, well, what do you want to, you know, just ask open-ended questions. And I was always surprised by pickup time the next day when she would get in the car and tell me she was okay with that friend. Mm -hmm. Now we know that's not how it always goes, but I was still really feeling it, was thinking, gosh, don't hang out with her anymore. And didn't learn not to say that. And that, that they had worked through that conflict. Yes. And that is what you're really talking about is how do we help them to navigate through the conflict yeah and i love that you mentioned your reaction because i would do that as well you know i think oh my gosh you know i would i would go back and ask and, and think that this is going to be an ongoing thing but often for for you know young kids and preteens it might be water under the bridge so so what i heard once that was so helpful to me is don't dig for pain you know so like if they're not talking about it anymore don't dig for pain just they have moved on we need to move on from that too but you know getting back to something that i do see you know triggered a lot of conflict in middle school is what you said so so there is some strife in a group and so there's you know say something goes on between two members of a you know a small social group they all start talking, you know, so one person talks to somebody else, the other person talks to somebody else, and now the group is involved, you know, so, and it feels like they're being gossiped about, gossiped about. people are talking behind their back. Um, so that, that scenario fueled a lot of drama. So in fact, I put this in the same chapter. The chapter is gossip and drama o drama because I found those two very much tied together. So what I like to talk to kids about is different kinds of gossip you know so in middle school it's super natural and as humans for us to know what's going on with our peers you know so so there's kind of informational gossip which is like who has a crush on who and who's fighting and who got expelled but then there's another kind of gossip that is actually people that are avoiding directly you know being resolving conflict with somebody so instead of directly resolving conflict they're circumventing and talking to others so if we could help our kids see that find a different safe 
space to talk it through because because this is the first time they've maybe dealt with this they do want to talk it through you know they want to talk it through and and process out loud and maybe get some validation but when that happens within that same social circle you know there there ensues lies the drama so just helping them navigate that in a way that doesn't cause more drama in their group which is why your book is so impactful is it really helps them to think through how am I going to navigate when this happens and kind of shining the light on it? Because I don't even think as a young adult that I knew what I was aware of what I was doing that rather than, and even as an adult, it's hard to go to somebody and say, wow, when you said that, that, you know, hurt my feelings. And I found that I usually misunderstand what they were actually saying. I just assumed even as an adult but in my early 20s and roommates, you know, rather than go to them, it was so easy to go to the other roommate and say, can you believe that she did that? And so you're teaching them how to do it early on in the book and to really shine the light on becoming more aware of that. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's such a great lifelong skill. And even choosing, you know, picking our battles, you know, so so what are, you know, what are the relationships we really care about that we do want to make sure we address the things that come up? And what are the ones that, you know, these aren't actually meaningful relationships even, you know, so if there is some, some look that we thought was maybe, you know, threatening in the hallway and, but that is not even a friend, let it go. You know, like, do we, do we even want to deal with that? You know, so to helping them pick their battles um, and, you know, where is it important for them to really be direct and ask and be curious and try to resolve things. And, and then what do we just let go? You know, cause it's, it's not even important to us. Mm -hmm. So good. So what if you what did you find the difference between what boys go through in middle school and girls go through? Yeah, you know, I I didn't find huge differences. I do I do think the girls talk more amongst themselves, um, but I think the experiences are fairly similar. So I and when I was researching this book, I would meet with small groups. I'd let kids, you know, write things down privately, you know, so I could get information in all sorts of ways. Um, and I didn't find huge differences, which is why, you know, all the quotes in the book, I don't even attribute to a name or a gender. It's just somebody said this about this, you know, about gossip or popularity. I just I just wanted to share those voices. So I wasn't finding huge differences. You know, maybe with girls, it might play out more, um, you know, because they are talking to their girlfriends more about we talked about, you know, trying to resolve things more. You know, circ you know, circumvent their friends and, and talk through situations like that. I saw maybe a little bit less with boys, but all the kids were concerned with the same things. So that to me was really interesting. You know, I, I didn't find I didn't find the boys weren't experiencing these things at all because they certainly were. I love that you're saying that. Not that that is, you know, that it's a good thing, but thank you because I I think that's that boys tend to not talk as much about it. And it maybe looks a little differently when they come home. And I, I know that I've heard since the pandemic um, from a lot of moms where their sons just shut down. Mm -hmm. They're not talking as much. They're maybe not hanging out with the same group. And knowing how to talk to their sons about it, where they're not maybe talking as much as the girls are, and, you know, and how you even deal with that. What would you say the mom or son's shutting down? He's maybe not hanging out with the same group. Um, what have you found that have, were boys saying what they would want when you were interviewing them? You know, they they did like talking about it. And maybe because I was, you know, not a parent, you know, or their teacher, I was just there, you know, sincerely curious about their experience. So they did, they did share with me. Um, especially, you know, privately when they wrote down notes. So, you know, when, when they didn't have to speak in front of the group and they wanted to share something, a personal story. So for, for parents, what I would say, um, you know, kids at this age, they really know when we're digging. So back to that digging thing. So we have to be careful not to come across like we're digging, but really just be curious and generally want to, you know, stay connected to them. So like, hey, 
that that seems like that situation was was kind of tricky or hey i'm curious about this new friend group you know you know what do you like about them you know so just staying you know open ended questions from a really grounded curious place um, and not assuming anything because you know one thing i also noticed is you know some kids they sail right through middle school and it's totally awesome. You know, they have a really small group of friends. They maintain those friends the whole way through. They kind of, they, you know, they go around the whole drama thing. They don't even experience that. And then there's others that have a different experience. So as parents, let's not assume, you know, they're experiencing things they might not be. You know, things might be totally fine and flowing with them and they're not worried about it at all. It might just be us. So just noticing their moods and their behaviors and, you know, so just, yeah, just, just observing and staying curious and really grounded. I think, you know, when, when we come across, like we really just want to connect and, and hear what's going on in their life, we are, have a better chance of connecting than if we're kind of digging, when it feels like we're digging. I love that. I wrote it down and I circled it twice. Don't dig for pain. Yep. <laughs> yes. Because, yeah. And being grounded because it, I find that even a lot of our own childhood experiences and things that we really struggled with, we tend to think that that's our kids' experience too. And like you said, it might not be. We're mm -hmm. just assuming. And so there were digging for it. And then sometimes we can send the message, not meaning to, but maybe something's wrong and it's bigger. We can make it bigger than it needs to be. So grounded. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing oh. they're gonna they're gonna navigate things differently than we did, you know. So back to the choose your own ending, you know, something that we might have really struggled with in middle school, they might not. Like that might not even be a thing for them because of who they are and their personality and their interests. So so yeah, just just you know, following them as they navigate and lead this experience. Yeah, I love that. And being curious, being curious. Um, so talk about changing friendships, because I that this is common as well, you know, where your kid was in a group, and then all of a sudden, you, they're not in that same group. And we can tend to panic. Why is that? Did something happen? So what did you what did you find in your research? And that was that was shared a bunch by kids, you know, that fr changing friendships is tricky and weird and hard and it is but what what helps parents i find is is if we realize that that is kind of what happens in middle school again not for everybody but is a huge period of change in fact there was a study done at ucla they followed six thousand kids through their first year of middle school and two-thirds of them changed friendships um and you know so this can be unsettling for both the kids, but also the parents, because we might think, well, hey, you've been friends with them for so long. Um, but it's it's a really natural thing to happen in middle school for all sorts of reasons. One, you know, as we know, kids are in such different developmental phases. You know, some might actually be still interested in, you know, relationships based on play and fun, you know, more like elementary school where some might be a little farther along and they're actually looking at deeper loves of connection and shared interests. You know, what I've seen is, you know, something as simple as one friend is way into crushes and the other isn't, that can cause a rift in that friendship. Or, or one group is way into cell phones and social media and somebody's just not, you know? So, so those little things can really shift friends and friendship groups as can dynamics you know so you could have this friendship group someone else enters it shifts up the whole dynamic and you know that might break things apart too so just knowing this is normal it happens you know what's happening is kids are fig they're starting to explore their own identities they're starting to figure out how to be a good friend they're starting to figure out what to look for in friendship um and you know change is the norm so just being okay with that letting them letting them navigate that now i'm not saying it's comfortable you know because again we're in this stage where more kids want to be accepted and belong more than anything so if they're in the midst of a friendship change that can feel really unsettling you know both for the kids and the parent so it's not comfortable but it's really normal and what i've seen over the course of you know the middle school years is they tend to eventually find a good fit you know might take a few a few groups and a few friendships but they tend to find 
you know, a, a friendship where they do feel like it's a good fit. And that's what we want for our kids, right? We want our friends to have friendships that feel like a great safe place for them, you know, a place where they do really feel like they are accepted and they belong. Yeah, I love that, being able to normalize that. And it's interesting because they can sometimes go through uh, where they are not friends with a certain friend group, but then high school, they might come back into that 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 friendship again. And I saw that with both of my daughters, like maybe they decide they didn't want to sit at that lunch table anymore. And, you know, then they're back sitting with them in high school, but that navigating those different friendships um, and figuring it out that we yes. don't have to panic. That, right. Yeah. yeah. And if, and what we can do that is helpful as parents is as they're going through this, if we can avoid labeling kids, you know, out loud. Well, she's the what if she's the mean girl. He's the because what I have seen now that I've got two kids in high school is everybody changes so much, you know, so so what you said is true. They do come back around. They might be on the team with this person they were best friends with in fifth grade and then now they're teammates in high school and they're still kind of, you know, they're not good friends anymore, but they now have a different sort of relationship. So, you know, if we as as parents can you know, stay out of the fray and labeling kids and let this change happen. Let these kids grow and change because they are different people. By the time they get to high school, I'm, I'm always blown away. I'm like, wow, that's so-and-so, you know, because they're so different and they've learned and they've grown and they've changed as we all do over the course of our lives. But I feel like during, you know, these middle school years, it just happens so fast. Um, you know, there's so much change going on and then it kind of settles out. It settles out. And there's so much change going on with us as we're trying to adapt also to the transitions that are happening yeah. and they're pulling away. They're maybe not talking as much. They're in middle school. There's just so many different things that we have to learn how to navigate those transitions and mm -hmm. can't set up their play dates anymore. And that's hard where you, we, we used to be able to make that happen. And now they're choosing who they want to hang out with or not hang out with. So just lots of things that, that are shifting for us as well as parents. Oh, absolutely. And just navigating the moods. You know, what I've found helpful for me is, you know, they, they, moods are up and down quite a bit, you know, because they are in the midst of puberty and, and there's a lot going on in their lives. So, so you know, if, if they're in a bad mood, you know, that's when I especially ground myself. I'm like, okay, whew, you know, they're allowed to be in a bad mood. You know, it doesn't mean they, they can be rude to me, you know, or, you know, but, but I allow them the space to be in a bad mood. Um, and I don't react to that, you know, and, and just settle myself and say, hey, looks like it was a tough day. You know, if there's anything I can do, let me know. You're just staying super grounded. I, you know, I, more than anything for my kids, I just want to be a safe space so they know they can come to me when they need it. Yeah. Well, and it doesn't work, does it? If you try to talk them out of a bad mood, <laughs> it, it, they don't go, okay, mom, yeah, I'm going to all of a sudden be happy. Yes. Yeah. So just allowing them to feel whatever they're feeling and navigate what they're navigating. Yeah. Um, very yeah, wise, wise, encouraging words. So Jessica, I love your positivity. I just love, you know, just your book. And I think that it is a book that um, every, every parent needs to buy or caregiver needs to buy for the, their kids, because it's, it's very unusual in how you have the quizzes and you have them thinking about how to work through that, that conflict. I don't know of a book that's been written like it. It is. It's a really different book. And to, to be honest, it felt like such a catharsis to write it because it felt like, oh, OK, now I've got it now. Now I get what it was going under gone going underneath the surface in middle school. So it was it was a joy to write. And it is a really, really different book. Um, but it really kind of sets the groundwork to how to navigate all sorts of tricky social stuff, um, you know, throughout life, not only in middle school, but just throughout life. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, please tell them where to find you. Um, the easiest place to find me is my website, which is Jessica Spear, S-P-E-E-R dot com. And um, 
you know, the I've got resources there, you know, both about social emotional stuff for kids and parents um, and links off to my books um, you know, where they're sold and and they are available anywhere books are sold. You know, sometimes we the, your local indie might not have it, but I'm sure they would get it in. And I always love to give a shout out to our local independent bookstores because they're just such a valuable part of our community. So so your local independent bookstore can absolutely get it in, but it's also available, you know, Barnes and Noble and Target and Amazon. It's a Target too. That's so exciting. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Target.com. Yeah. 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 That is awesome. And you have a new book coming out. So we'll have to write this year that yes. you're working on around the yes. digital world. Yes. So um, the, the, the new book comes out this summer, summer 2023. It's called The Phone Book uh, because that, you know, once I got mid middle school figured out, I thought, okay, now the next tricky thing I want to tackle for, you know, preteens and teens is life with the phone, you know, because now our social world has, you know, in for kids especially has kind of moved into that realm. And there's a lot to talk about there. So that book, you know, talks about all that. It talks about privacy and digital drama and misinformation and disinformation and cyber bullying and you know all those conversations that you know we as parents want to have with our kids you know that have devices um but you know my specialty is talking right to the kids because kids are so smart you know so i just like to give them the information directly yeah and they and they can contact you because you also speak at schools work with kids um on these issues and getting them to talk about it because i was reading some of your reviews and just how comforting it is for the kids to know they're not alone and yes. to get them talking is huge. I mm -hmm. think for all of us to know we're not alone in our challenges and struggles and something is not wrong with us. So yes. you do that as well, right? Oh Sometimes yeah. To reach out and you've done online stuff in person. Absolutely. I always love to, you know, connect with classrooms, connect with schools, you know, do programs at libraries. So if there's any way I can jump in and help, you know, that's one of my favorite things to do is actually be on the ground working with kids or, you know, speaking with parents. Yeah, wonderful. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for coming on and we'll have to have you back once your book, your new book comes out. Oh, I'd love it. We could talk about the phone book. There's lots to talk about there. Oh, gosh, we need lots of help with that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me, Cheryl. It was such a joy to chat with you.